Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, believe it or not, um, Easter is almost here. Next week is Palm Sunday, uh, Palm and Passion Sunday, and then that kicks off Holy Week, and then Easter is the next week, and it's just like that. So um, this week is the final, the fifth and final sermon in the Christian Mythbusters series that we've been doing. And our topic for the week is suffering. Will you pray with me? That's right, season finale. <laughs> Let us pray. God, you are present with us even in our deepest grief and our hardest struggles. Give us ears to hear your voice, and if we aren't the ones who can hear, then give us community that can hear for us and speak a true word of hope and care. We pray in the name of Jesus, our man of great sorrows. Amen. Uh, so I'll start out on the topic of the Christian Mythbusters. Although there are a few writers out there who seem to think that Christianity is the source of all suffering that exists in the world, uh, it is that actually that. Um, I have tried over the course of this series to point out places where Christianity has, has and maybe continues to cause suffering. But this sermon on suffering is not to say that, guess what, it all belongs to us. Um, although to be fair, uh, whoops, the myth I'm going to go after this week actually is the idea that suffering always has some kind of meaning behind it. Although to be fair, that idea of suffering having a particular meaning has a much longer history than just the last couple thousand years of Christianity. Um, I'm thinking about the book of Job, which was written about 600 years before Jesus. And it is basically all about suffering that doesn't have a discernible meaning. But that doesn't stop Job's three friends, and even another speaker who gets edited in later, from arguing that his tremendous losses and his horrible health problems are the result of something that he did, some sin that he committed, karma, if you will, to mix religions, right? Good people, the friends argue, don't go through terrible things like this. So go ahead and confess your sins, and God will forgive and restore you. No, Job says, I didn't do anything wrong. I won't confess when it's God who is being unjust. And as it turns out, Job is right not to confess, and the friends are wrong. That being said, though, there is something that Job's friends do before they begin their lectures that shows that they truly are friends to Job. Job has lost all his children, all his property, and his health. And their first and best response is simply to sit with him in silence for three days. They don't say anything, they just sit there with him. I think our tendency these days in the face of suffering, in the face of a death or a devastation, a devastating illness, in the face of failure or discrimination, is to try to rush past the pain. We don't necessarily blame tragedies on someone's sins, or at least we don't if we're not Pat Robertson, but we do find other ways. Is that like a too mean of a dig? Anyway, too late it's out there. But we do try to find other ways to quickly explain and dispatch painful realities. Uh, funerals can be a site for some of the worst easy cliches. God needed another angel, for example, is just never a true reason for an untimely death. But somehow it puts the tragedy in God's hand, in, hands in this weird and sentimental way. She's in a better place now, or his time had come might possibly be true in some cases. But they don't really get at the enduring pain of the grief of having a whole person missing from our lives. Although it's interesting, you just told that story about Petey, and that's basically what your grandma said to you. Well, anyway. It did something, but maybe didn't help you feel better about Petey. I don't know. Whether or not his time had come, we still miss the person. We still want him back. Sometimes cancer patients find it is hard to tell people about their diagnosis, and it's not exactly because the information is hard for them, although it may be, but because the people that they tell don't know what to do with this, and they turn to the patient for help and comfort, for leadership, really, from the person who's sick, which can get tiring. And I recently read a cartoon book that had two chapters on depression. Um, it's really a cartoon, seriously. It's called Hyperbole and a Half. And she's a really good storyteller. And the drawings are very simple looking, and, but they convey all this emotion. It's great. Anyway, so the writer dealt with this long bout of serious depression and got to a point where she just wasn't feeling anything. Like she had no feelings. 
And she would try to tell people this, that she didn't have any hope or feelings at all, really, any response. And the response to her pain would be like a lot of positivity and encouragement. She said it was as if she had a pile of dead fish, and she would tell someone, these fish are dead. And they would say, oh, let me help you find your fish. Or have you tried feeding them? Which was not a response to the problem she was having. It seemed like the people she told about this weren't really hearing and understanding her. She writes, the problem, the problem might not even have a solution, but you aren't necessarily looking for solutions. You're maybe just looking for someone to say, sorry about how dead your fish are, or wow, those are super dead. I still like you though. <laughs> She's, anyway, it's worth reading the whole thing. Um, if you thought that part was funny, uh, which I do. If you don't, then whatever. But the thing about suffering is that we, we kind of want to move past it. We like to hope that by being a follower of Jesus or doing everything right or keeping everyone happy, that somehow we'll be able to dodge suffering or at least to be able to metabolize it quickly and easily. And it's understandable that we would want that, even if it's not very realistic. Who really wants to be in pain? The whole point of pain is that it hurts and it feels bad. Pain is a signal to avoid whatever is causing it. Which makes Jesus' behavior in our story from Scripture today very odd. Jesus is arrested, Pilate is questioning him, and then has him flogged. And then Pilate is doing some back and forth with the Jewish authorities, trying to, talk, trying to talk them into letting Jesus go. So the center of the story in this conflict between the Judean leaders trying to keep everybody else safe by sacrificing a troublemaker, and Pilate, who's portrayed in John, as a nice guy who wants to do the right thing, but gets bullied into doing the wrong thing. So that's one storyline, right? But the other story is Jesus, who is facing down a painful and humiliating death. The flogging, for example, is the kind of horrible punishment that you'd never want to come up against. And the practice with flogging at the time was that you were only supposed to give 39 lashes because if, you got, if a person got more than 40, it was thought to kill them, right? And so if you get to 40, you, you don't want to miscount, so you go to 39, just to be sure you don't go one extra. So, right, so it's like 39 out of 40 and you're dead. So the soldiers, and then the soldiers humiliate Jesus. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They wrap him in a purple robe. And the suffering is physical and social, in other words. And this is all before Jesus is even put to death. Um, and I just have to say, totally an aside, and I apologize, I'm going off script, but it is very strange in a way. The soldiers are, like, crowning Jesus. Like, it's like a coronation ceremony in a certain way. Like, another level is a coronation ceremony. But, like, anyway, okay. But what I want to focus on in the final exchange between Jesus and, is this final exchange between Jesus and Pilate. Pilate tries to strong arm Jesus into telling him more. Uh, to defending himself, to giving him another reason to say no to the crucifixion. But Jesus' response is this. If you think your power is important, you're wrong. All your power comes from God and really from me. In other words, the suffering and this death are something that Jesus is choosing. And I think that is the difference here between Jesus and so many who went before him and so many who came after him on the cross. The suffering is suffering that he's choosing, and he chooses it for a reason, for a meaningful purpose. Because while I said earlier that we all avoid suffering, there's an important exception, which is suffering with a deeper meaning, with a larger purpose. Sometimes taking on suffering can serve a greater purpose. Uh, for example, as we've seen in the civil rights movement and before in India's independence movement, suffering in this method of nonviolent resistance brings injustice into such sharp relief that um, it's impossible for people to ignore, and it creates a path for alleviating it. But it's vital to remember that there is a lot of suffering that by itself doesn't have its own meaning. That sometimes things just happen, or more ominously, they happen because of someone else's faulty choices. Suffering because of our own choices is a whole other sermon, but some of the principles still apply, right? My point is that the meaning comes from the, the meaning that comes from the suffering isn't in the pain itself, and no one can choose redemptive suffering for us on our behalf, or decide for us what the meaning of our suffering will be if it will have meaning. 
Jesus and choosing the life he chooses and in choosing the death he chooses is breaking into our own lives of suffering, especially, particularly the suffering that people inflict on each other. But not only that, Jesus as God in human form knew what it was like to be human, to have the joys and the hurts of life. God knows from the inside out how much life can hurt sometimes. God is not glossing over or skimming past real suffering. Jesus' death draws attention, opens up, and shows us all the unjust deaths that came before his, all the human sacrifices made to keep the peace. Jesus takes on a death that turns the structures of authority inside out to try and prevent the kind of suffering that powerless people all over the world have had to face again and again. Jesus knows the fish are dead, and he's not going to pretend otherwise. Jesus comes and sits with us in death for three days. So here's the good news for today. There's no need to pretend with Jesus. God knows our struggles. We are not alone in them. And the second part of it is this. There is a lot of suffering that doesn't have its own meaning. But sometimes what happens in the wake of that suffering does bring new meaning. Not that we would choose the loss or the grief or the injustice. Not that God has somehow chosen that pain for us in a prearranged kind of way. But still, we learn from the experience. PD is just coming up as a great example, right? Because you learned about listening for God. But it's not like, well, anyway, I'm not going to keep labor, be laboring PD. But he's just like, he's right there. It's, Lois, it's like you started my sermon. Anyway. Um, uh, okay, so, but we, we learn from the experience, right? Or we find a new and deeper truth. Or we find ways to connect with somebody else and to hold hands with someone through a difficult time. The meaning isn't in the suffering, necessarily, but in our response to it, in God's response to it. The whole miracle of Jesus' life on earth as both a human being and as God is God's tremendous reaching out to us in the midst of our suffering. May the Spirit guide us in following that compassionate example by the grace of Jesus who always walks with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. So let's have some time for silence and reflection. Um, Our reflection question is, where do you see God working in the midst of suffering?